Hello, everybody. My name is Peter Wainwright. I'm the host of tonight's uh, OUBS Business Perspectives webinar, and the title for this evening is Change Management. This follows along from the highly successful face-to-face uh, -face event we had in London on the 11th of July. So this is a development event. Um, we've got uh, several attendees. We've got over 100 attending, and the numbers are rising as I speak. And it's about putting change into practice the, the, uh, and, and really practical tools. Now, on the screen there, you can see me on the left. Um, I'm the director of a company called Aspira, which is a consultancy in strategy and innovation. I'm also an OUBS associate lecturer. With us, we have two panelists, Professor David Wilson and David Montgomery. So I'll just ask them to briefly say hello. Hello, uh, I'm Dave Wilson. Calling me Dave will help. Um, distinguish me from David Montgomery. I'm a professor of organization studies and strategy at the Open University Business School, and I've just started. I was previously acting dean of Warwick Business School. And I'm Thank looking you. forward to today. Thank you. And David Montgomery. Hello, everyone. I'm David Montgomery. I'm a quality and improvement and training specialist. Uh, like, I understand the, the Open University journey as I have an MBA. Uh, from the Open University, and I've spent the last 25 years uh, working, helping people change, and helping them develop their recipes for change, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion this evening. Lovely. Well, th thank you very much. Um, I'll briefly uh, e explain the, uh, the format. The attendees, uh, we have our, th our three panelists and, and various people behind the scenes technically uh, helping us. Uh, the attendees, I'm asking you to use the chat only. We're not using the Q&A because it's just too complicated to have both windows. So the chat is for there for you to say hi. Maybe if you're, if you're from outside UK, tell us where you're from. Uh, last time I had people from Japan and America, so across huge time, zo time zones. It's also the place for you to pose your questions and observations as, as we roll through the uh, program. Uh, just to let you know, this webinar is being recorded and will be available uh, in a few weeks' time. And if you are uh, a tweeter, you can see uh, the uh, Twitter address and the hashtag. So I invite you to uh, get tweeting. Right, the webinar objectives are really to, to share some of the learning, some snippets from the learning from that 11th of July uh, event, um, and for you to gain some insights about your own change management practice. So. We're really keen for this to be a development uh, from that event, so uh, most people attending won't, won't have been at that event, which is absolutely fine. We're not assuming any prior knowledge of you having been there on the 11th. So if you've got, again, if you've got any questions about the, uh, the process, do put them in the chat, and one of my colleagues hopefully uh, will, will respond. Okay, the webinar agenda. Well, I've covered uh, most of point one there. Um, I'm shortly be asking uh, David Wilson just to give us a brief overview of the 11th of July. And then you can see we've got uh, three kind of segments there, uh, three videos, and we've got a poll for two of those. And then we summarize and close, finishing at uh, 8 o'clock. So perhaps if I could ask uh, David Wilson just to give us a flavor of, of, the, of the event, please. Of course, yeah. The, the, the day was intended to try and be inclusive, so it's fairly heroic to cover all this stuff in a day, but we got there. Um, there are three main areas of change that we covered. The first is the context of change, and by that I mean organizational structure and culture. The second would be um, the organization itself, and here I'd be talking about governance, um, communication, and so on. And the third area would be individual um, areas of change, in particular uh, toward the ed end of the, uh, the, the day when we looked at things like um, verbal communication and how, uh, how messages are received by others. So we tried to cover the whole spectrum um, as far as we could. Brilliant. Thank, well, thank you very much. And, and more information about this is on the OUBS uh, Business Perspectives uh, website. Okay, well, let us roll ahead with the, uh, the, the program. The first one is going to be a short video, actually featuring uh, snippets from David Wilson's uh, talk, and it runs for about seven or eight minutes. So we'll run that, and then we'll have some dialogue between the participants and our panelists. So hopefully the video will now appear. <laughs>
Now another part of the equation which is important is this question of what kind of organisation do you create? This is Roger Harrison's work and he, he characterises, many of you will know this, uh, recognise this, culture in at least these three different forms. Spider's web, a culture of control. You can find this in big organisations, in small departments, you can find this in family businesses, you can find this in all sorts of necks of the world. professional organisations like this too. They have great advantages because if you imagine a spider sitting at the centre of this, then all a spider has to do is place that structure, the web, where there's a market, flies, and the market will come to it. Okay? Um, and it's controlled by this spider. Everything's controlled by this spider. So let's, let's, let's go for a bit of cost-cutting here. Um, these are known in the jargon as FIFO cultures, fit in or fall out. Okay? <laughs> See, I would be polite. And the thing is, you don't need HR. You don't need HR. Everybody's committed. Everybody who remains in this organisation is 110%. I know it's bad science, 110% behind. Okay? So you've got some, in theory, some fantastic advantages. Because you can be proactive in terms of change. You can see what's happening out there in the market. You can come back in the organisation and say, hey, we're going to do this, and you can move really quickly. They've got speed, flexibility, proactivity on their side. Of course, the fourth thing that's often not mentioned is they're also highly risky. You know, what happens if that spider gets it wrong? Well, the answer is enthusiastically going into business, equally enthusiastically going out of business. Um, so this can happen in a, a very short time. And all the literature on entrepreneurialism uh, will we'll, we'll guard against that, of course. Bureaucracies, we all recognise those. Um, Doric columns, you enter a step, depending on age, experience and previous qualifications. The granite slab at the top is senior executive management. This thing will not fall over in the wind, it's designed to last. It's also reactive when it comes to change. But a lot of people and a lot of consultants and a lot of advice from people like me, academics too, have caused organisations to mess about with this structure by outsourcing, that means just taking one of the direct columns out, for example, uh, by bringing the granite slab closer to the floor so communication can improve. All sorts of experiments are being done with this kind of structure in order to try and make it change better. Nevertheless, it remains reactive. Whatever you do with it, it remains reactive. And the task-based organisation, which is based around sometimes known as the matrix, but it's project-based, where you, based on expertise, you get experts together and you make sure that whatever hierarchical uh, uh, position they are in a company, then they will be the people who, who mobilise change. Two problems. One is, where is finance directors, because you can get a proliferation of projects um, and then you have to make a decision which projects have sunset clauses and, and stop and others don't. And the second problem you get with those is you run out of experts quite quickly. Most organisations, most of the time, even universities, don't have enough experts. It's quite simple. Um, so the marketing director you might want on your project, I might want on mine, but there's only one of him or her. So it, it's a big problem. And most organisations, most of the time, are, are a mixture of these. But if you know what the mixture is, like a, like a good recipe, you can tell what the flavour is going to be in terms of implementation. So at least you've got some, some, some prediction on your side. So we went to have a look at that and we distilled out two things which are really important and operate independently in your organisations. And they are what I'm going to call here the knowledge base of the organisation, how smart you are, how smart your people are. And the other thing that came out was this question of the, the organisational context that I've just been through, this, this cultural, structural effigy that we call an organisation. Now what's interesting is they're independent. Whatever test you run, at least over a, a period of 10 years, they're independent, they operate independently when it comes to change. So if we take something like knowledge, we're talking about things like technologies and procedures, skills, know-how, collective individual knowledge and so on. And you can map it by the matrix. I told you one was coming, here it is. And what's interesting is you can map the knowledge base of your, your company, your organisation, and the receptivity. How receptive is this organisation to this change? And again, on a simple high-low. Now, it doesn't take anybody in this audience by surprise to know that the top right-hand cell there are probably the best performers when it comes to change, and the bottom left-hand cell are not. The top right-hand cell have high knowledge base, they have very smart people, smart technologies, smart procedures, and they also have a highly receptive organisational structure, culture, and so on. And the opposite is true down at the bottom left. What's very interesting to me is the rank order in which performance of change goes. Because if four is the highest, Three is over in the top left-hand cell, and two is down here 
in the bottom right, and one, of course, we've mentioned already. I mentioned each change was different. They are, but some organisations seem to get it right more than others. So let me give you some organisational names there that go with that. Um, just recently, Apple's been getting it right for quite some time. Uh, smart people and an organisation that just supports their changes, OK? It doesn't take me to tell you that story. Nestle and Philips, some of the brightest organisations and the brightest brains in the business, but some of the most medieval structures I've encountered. Um, National Grid. National Grid in, this, in, this, in, in, in the UK is a wonderful coiled spring of an organisation that's ready to leap at any opportunity. But it's full of engineers who just don't think in terms of strategic change. Some great engineers. But they've, so they, they've got this structure and they've invested in it, but actually the payoff is relatively low in terms of change because they simply don't have that, that knowledge base. And I've put poor old Marks and Spencer down there at the bottom um, simply as an example of that's where they got to. They actually moved from, from an apple, understanding the retail market and being very good at it, to the point when Gap and Next and all the rest happened, and they just fell down to that bottom cell. So, I've raised all of those questions, okay? That's a big thing. Governance, the kind of organisation you've got, and the fact that two of these things seem really to matter. Okay, competing on talent, and making sure that you don't run round in circles trying to make your structure fit your strategy when actually you get more payoff from investing in bright people. You've seen uh, a seven-minute segment uh, from <coughs> David Wilson looking at uh, structures and the knowledge base. Um, I'm going to invite them for some comment uh, in a second, but we'd really love to hear from the participants about, about your experience. How, how, do, how do you manage those two uh, kind of tensions or axes? Uh, how, how do you make sure that the people with the knowledge to actually make change happen don't get hampered by the structures? And, and uh, well, how, do, how do the structures uh, uh, enable them? Um, whilst we're waiting for comments to come through, I will be uh, just asking uh, David Wilson briefly for some, perhaps some follow-up points or, or reflections. I mean, in your experience, uh, David, do, do you think structures tend to kind of get in the way of, of releasing the knowledge and the creativity that's needed for, for change? What's your thoughts on that? I, th I think they can do. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not definite that they will. Um, and, and by the way, it's just a myth that centralized structures are bad and decentralized structures are good. Um, it, it really depends. You can find a good examples of centralized structures without a problem. The problem is, is that most of the change efforts that we've looked at, and that's 155 of them, um, they're, they're, they're characterized by managers deciding that something was wrong with the structure and, and changing it and expecting structural change and indeed cultural change to yield immediate results uh, and th they don't yield results as, as, as well as um, probably investing in smart people if you go back to that matrix very few organizations of people who are listening to me today will start at the center of the axis they'll, they'll have already have moved some way down some way of structurally altering their organization um, and the problem with that is um, boards and policy committees will just say, well, we've done this, you know, time one and time two. Uh, it didn't work as well as we, we thought. Let's, let's try it again in time three. When, in fact, all the data indicate that you should think again and actually think about, well, how do we increase our talent base rather than go through for a structural reorganization yet again? Right. Okay, thanks very much. And I'll now go to uh, David Montgomery. In fact, there's a, there's a question, David, I don't know if you've seen that uh, from Janine Jones. Uh, talking about structure getting in the way of change in a, in a local authority and a, and a point there about kind of different cultures. Um, so what, 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 what's your thoughts on that, uh, David? I, I, think, I, I think I just want to echo what, what uh, Dave uh, Wilson has said, that it, different structures are not necessarily the impediment. I think it, all, it comes back to don't assume 
that one method of communication is going to work. Um, one analogy I, I would bring is when, when you're trying to share the message about tr change, it's not the same as sending a parcel. If you send someone a parcel, you can say, did you get the parcel? Yes, I got the book. It arrived. If you're sending someone a message, there's a degree of interpretation. And I, I think one of the things that is very important to remember is what you send is not necessarily what people uh, here, and we'll be coming on to talk about that, I know, in, in due course. But it, it is a critical point, irrespective of the structure that you're dealing with. I, I hope that uh, addresses the point that uh, Janine has raised. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> interesting point there from uh, Isabel Page about <clears throat> this idea of competence sharing, which is a, uh, in, in interesting phrase and linking to, to, to communication. Um, so I'm just wondering if... Uh, um, I mean, David Wilson, have you got? Have you got any? Tell us a bit more about uh, Apple because you put them in the sort of top right-hand kind of quadrant. What is it that they do well uh, in terms of integrating the sort of their knowledge um, approach, knowledge-based company with structures that makes them so successful in, in managing change? Um, two things, I think. In the early days, if we, uh, uh, the very early days, I'm talking here in the 1980s and 1990s when Apple was riding high for the, for the first time, it was a new company. I mean, Steve Jobs was there. Um, he hired, in his own words, insanely great people um, who were quirky, to say the least, um, but he left them alone. And he didn't uh, shroud them or, or, or bound them with, with, with structures. What's interesting is in the, what I would call the second phase of Apple, and we're coming right up to you know, iPod, iPad, at the date, and technologies and so on, is uh, jobs did have structures. By that time, Apple was a fairly complex organization, and you can't avoid some kind of structure. But what jobs did was he modeled that organization very much like Nokia was in its, uh, in its, in its heyday too, where um, they would have two or three streams of the business, and people would hop between streams of the business and would be allowed autonomy to create um, you know, new technologies or use new technologies. And then the decision was, well, do we incorporate this technology into our products, or do we just uh, put a patent out and sell it? Um, and so what happened was people got around this organization pretty quickly and began to understand what the whole organization was about rather than just a little bit of it. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And I think um, it, it's interesting. We often put up Apple as a great exemplar, and I'm sure there are other exemplars from from our so our panelists. So if anyone's got any ex really good examples of of, uh, of, of implementing change uh, along in, in this topic, it'd be great to hear from you. Can, before we move on, um, just ask uh, David Montgomery. Is there's a point there about sort of um, if change more readily embraced if the, if the culture permits it, or may, maybe actually it's the culture that's more important than worrying about the structure. Um, so, so what, can you tell us what, what's your views about this sort of cultural aspect? Well, if, if there's a, a culture or if there's a habit of change, uh, there was, uh, for example, we, we're going to go on and discuss uh, uh, Cisco. If you're, if you're an organization that is used to change, or, uh, then, then it's something you're more familiar with. It's, to some extent, change is all about the fear of the unknown. Uh, and also the size of an organization, which is indirectly linked to culture. If you're an enormous organization, I've seen someone's just, uh, if you look at something like the NHS, 1.3 million people, or if you look at something much smaller, uh, you're going to have a diffusion rate of, of change th throughout an organization. And I, I think it's important to consider the culture, um, but someone, I saw another post there saying, do, should we change structure, I, th I think what you need to do is consider what is the change you're trying to make. And I think organizational restructuring is in itself a change. So yes, culture can make a difference. If, if it's an organization that has done the same thing same way for many, many years, then they will find it initially uh, a different experience. Not necessarily more difficult, but something that's different. It's new. Change, to me, is all about learning and learning how to learn, learning how to deal with it, what works best, what helps most, what helps least and then using that to create your own recipes. That Brilliant. Lovely. That sounds like a degree of risk-taking and experimentation is, uh, is needed. Uh, well, that neatly links into, into video two, which we're just about to see. We're going to see uh, two, two uh, segments, um, one from uh, Phil Smith, who's CEO of Cisco in um, uh, Britain and uh, Ireland, and, uh, and a segment from Professor Brian Smith, and we'll have a short poll after that, so the video should now be appearing. We, 
like to think, as many companies do, I'm sure that we're quite good at changing, but you know, I, I would definitely agree that there are times that we do make change which isn't successful. I'm not sure that's entirely a bad thing in the bigger round, if you will. I mean, if, if you're looking at it from a change perspective, you can argue it's bad. But when you're looking at it in the kind of dynamics of a company, to make changes and for some of those changes to be not successful is, is a good thing because it means you're probably trying things, you're being experimental, you're, you know, you're trying to push the boundaries a lot. But there are many things, and I would encourage people in my organisation and anywhere, to be looking at change um, as a more of a habit, if you will, rather than an occasional uh, an occasional exercise, because it genuinely does mean you get you know you you are you're testing the boundaries all the time, which is good. How do you recruit people with that habit? Yeah, it's an interesting point. I mean, recruitment, talent, etc., is massively important. I mean, you know, and and one of the areas that I'm very passionate about is the kind of diverse recruitment. But I think if you are an organisation that is open to, um, you know, open to uh, to making change. Then, you know, the, the your recruitment is slightly self fulfilling. In other words, you'll probably recruit people who you feel are the kind of people you want to make change. And I think you have to be careful of that as well, because you know we all recruit in our own likeness, which means we end up, you know, slightly siloing or slightly uh, kind of m um, minimizing the the pool. But I think. You know, recruiting people who have got a propensity to do the sorts of things we do in Cisco is obviously important. History and human nature suggests that as organisations get older and as human beings get older, they get more resistant to, to, to change. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's probably true. Um, and, and I think that um, there are various ways of getting over it. Um, we certainly like to make sure we bring lots of new people into the organisation. I don't just mean we like to bring young people in. We like to bring people again of different, you know, diverse um, capabilities and, and ways of thinking into the organisation. I mean, the other thing we do is we're highly acquisitive as a company, and I wouldn't say it was necessarily part of the change process, but it brings from a technological and a market perspective, which is also extremely important in the change aspect, as opposed to just thinking about our own people. So that energises people as well, and then, and then actually, we also just like people to, we try to use, for the, from an age perspective, we try to use people in effective ways. We have sort of reverse mentoring, where we have young people mentoring. So some of the young graduates reverse mentor me and other people on the board. And, and you made quite a lot of changes when the kind of recession hit. When you get pressures that, like the recession, um, you know, they've, they talk to, you know, the companies obviously react to them. But depending on how cataclysmic they are, they either just try to adapt there or they go fundamentally to make some change. Obviously, we probably did bits of both. I mean, one of the interesting things we did during the recessionary times was, and it was a kind of interesting opportunity to make a, another one of these kind of transitionary changes. We were already starting to use a little bit of video. We'd, we'd announced a technology called telepresence, which is like super high-end video um, conferencing. But, you know, it was kind of doing okay and people were using bits of it. But when the recession hit, we basically said internally, you cannot travel for internal meetings. Right, that's it. You can't travel for internal meetings. It just stop it. And we, one of those changes, you know, people complained about it, didn't want to do it, management had to get aligned. We eventually all started to do it. What interestingly happened, I mean, so first of all, people then started to, to realise, actually, this is not such a bad thing. You know, being in Charles de Gaulle Airport on a Friday night, you know, to go to an internal meeting for two hours, or whatever, isn't the best thing in the world, you know. Stuff about the flights are being cancelled and all that sort of stuff. So actually, the fact that you could go on and do a video meeting quite quickly was interesting. The fact that actually in the first year alone, we saved half a billion dollars of, on, on tra air travel was pretty interesting. We also saved, you know, I think 80,000 tonnes of carbon, I think, um, as a result of it. Um, and we did, we did better stuff. When we talk about change management or start implementation, of course, what we mean is activity, doing something. Okay? And the doing things that we do fall into two categories. There's Non-discretion activity, that is the stuff that can be measured, rewarded, punished, sanctioned, okay, the things we can attach smart objectives to. And then there's the discussionary activity that can't be. Stuff like sharing information with your colleagues, okay, doing things with a positive attitude, responding, going above and beyond the task. 
Now, the vast majority of the change management literature, you'll notice, refers to the non-discussion activity. It's about setting up metrics and, and measuring things and project teams and stage gates and all that stuff. Relatively little attention is paid to the stuff on the right, which is ironic because in knowledge-based organisations, which, looking at the delegate list, most of you work in, okay, in knowledge-based organisations, it seems to be the discretionary activity, the, the, the soft, touchy-feely stuff, as my PhD supervisor used to call it, that adds the most value. What we do know, and this is, this is some data from our exploratory research at OU, okay, is that strategy is not always implemented. Okay, so if you've got a change management strategy, it is not always implemented. In our research, only about half of people agreed or strongly agreed that their strategy was implemented. Remember, of course, that this sample that we tested it from had a, a response bias. Okay? These were people whose job it was to make it happen. Okay? So you would expect, if anything, they would big up their results, wouldn't you? And in fact, only, so if anything, the result is worse than this. But of course, one of the things we were looking for is, ah, well, sometimes when you don't implement your strategy, it's deliberate. You get halfway through, circumstances have changed, so you deliberately change things. But actually, our results told us that mostly wasn't the case either. There's a lot of what you might call inadvertent, accidental, unintentional, non-implementation of strategy. everybody, it's uh, Peter, your facilitator here. Um, if you've just joined us, hopefully you've got the hang of uh, how, how we're operating this. Um, we're going to have a poll uh, in, a, in a very short while. I'll put the poll questions up. And while that's up, I'll also mention a slight technical snag. In fact, before that, I'll mention it. Uh, on the chat, it seems that you're not able to send your questions to all participants, so you can't... Um, see each other's questions. So what I'm going to ask is to use the, the Q&A. Now, if you type it, it can be a question or comment. It doesn't have, just have to be a question. And we may just type a, a, just a character and press send. That way it becomes visible. That way, at least you can all see your, uh, the Q&A, whereas at the moment, if you're a participant and you send something to the panelists, um, other people can't see it. So can we please switch to the Q&A mode? Hopefully that's clear. Right, we've got a, a, a poll here based on that last uh, uh, video segment. Um, so what we want to know, and hopefully the, you'll see the poll here, it'll be live for a few minutes. Which one of these will most help you in implementing change? Is it A, you actually need to improve your own decisiveness, maybe listen to others but focus less on the sort of collaborative decision making, um, involve people but it's decisiveness. B, maybe promote whole organizational commitment rather than just within my own team, so we don't get kind of conflicts and, and pecking orders between the teams. C, to improve project leadership, rather than be concerned about sort of functions and, and structures and not constant reorganization. Or D, uh, as Phil was saying, maybe work, find and work with people who actually see change as a habit. That should be a primary requirement for how you uh, find people to work with. So let's just see what the uh, your responses are. The poll's open. You click A, B, C, or D, and you press the submit in the bottom right-hand um, corner. I'm hoping we have got some uh, either some old chat messages about this uh, or some Q&As um, coming through. Um, I'll just relay. There's, there's a point here which I'll ask our panelists to respond to. Isabel Page says... Um, Implementation often fails because of analysis paralysis and the importance of personal agendas and lack of embedded engagement. So that very much links to this sort of uh, perhaps point B there. So um, David Wilson, what, what's your thoughts about uh, how much we need to shift towards whole organizational commitment rather than just trying to big up our own team? Oh, absolutely. Um, you're going to get nowhere just picking up your own team um, because the only thing that will happen is you'll start a political battle followed by a financial battle, um, and or probably this two together. Um, so whole, whole organizational commitment is absolutely uh, vital for this. And, of course, in recessionary times and times like with the NHS, for example, when policy is actually formulated outside the organization in question, 
then what you find is the tendency is to hunker down and protect your own project, um, when actually the, the greater payoff comes from, from organizational commitment. Easy to say and hard to do, I'll, I'll accept that. Um, but nevertheless, that's extremely important. Okay, I, thanks very much. And, and uh, uh, David Montgomery, you mentioned earlier about sort of um, learning and, and change. What, what, what do you think of uh, Phil's view about working and finding people who see change as a habit, and perhaps they're more skilled at, at this attitude of change and less skilled at, at their sort of functional expertise, perhaps? Do you have any thoughts on that? I think we all have a different r range of skills, but I think in, in relation to when we're looking at change and we're looking at learning, it, it's paradoxical that we talk about lifelong learning, uh, and yet sometimes change can appear as a surprise or something that is not so welcome. If we're going to live in an age of lifelong learning, we, we're in a knowledge economy with knowledge workers, then it, it's important that we are, have the skills of learning. It's the one thing that you're, you're seldom taught at school, how to learn. You're taught how to pass exams. You give yeah. the materials to pass, but you're not actually taught how to learn. What about a bit of reflection? What a bit of trial and error? What a bit of taking a risk and then learning about what happens? It's, it's not formulaic change. You will find things that work well, and you'll find things that work uh, that don't help as much. You have to determine. If you get into the habit of learning and find out what helps you the most, what's the best way to communicate, uh, what's the best way to check the messages got through, this will undoubtedly help you. And another Brilliant. point, just to pick up on something that, sure. that the other David said, was uh, leadership, uh, getting across the whole organizational commitment. One of the key functions of leadership is to be an ambassador, to be diplomatic, to span the boundaries rather than, well, to be a boundary spanner rather than being a spanner in the works. And it's about getting, thinking beyond your own team and really going across. It's, if you're working in an international organization, that means going across international boundaries. But there's absolutely no reason you can't go across functional boundaries. I've spent most of my life in a multifunctional, a multidisciplinary environment, and that becomes second nature. Okay. Uh, let's, let's have a quick look at the, uh, the poll, polls ended. So I'm going to ask uh, David Wilson. So it's very interesting how... Oh, interesting. The people doing leadership training might not be too happy on the 7% there for Part A. So what, what's your response to the results? Is it perhaps different to what you're expecting? Any thoughts? No, I, I think it fulfills, well, it sort of, it, you know, depends what, 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 what both David has said. Um, I mean, I think the question of whole organizational commitment and, and having change, uh, people who, are, who see change as a habit is, is extremely important. Of course, I mean, you don't, as Phil Smith said, you, you, don't, you don't want to employ a load of wacky people and just let them go. You, you do have to have some leadership skill and commitment around that. And I think it's very important to recognize that um, the, the primary role of the board of, of any organization or, or trustees in a nonprofit is, is to um, instill the values and to cross the boundaries and to as David said, you know, to, to instill leadership across the whole organization, not just parts of it. Um, but increasingly, we've seen regulation of boards in, in, in the UK and the US and elsewhere. And that's causing them to close down too uh, and just tick boxes and say, well, we've done our job. That's fine. We've ticked the boxes. But actually, they're failing to, to get this whole organization commitment. So I think there's a great deal of, of, of leadership involved and, and wrapped up in this too, especially from, from the governance side of organizations. Brilliant. Thank, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, well, I remember on the, on the day, for those of you who weren't there, what Brian was trying to say was we shouldn't be too obsessed with these specific kind of change models and smart objectives. Um, and therefore, you can see in this poll the kind of the bias, the first part of it is about decisiveness, organizational commitment, project leadership, change as a habit. This is the sort of axis we should be um, moving towards. Um, I don't know if, if uh, my fellow panelists can see, but I'm, I'm still waiting to see if we've got any, uh, any more chat or q and I'm sorry about the technical uh, snag there. Um, so have any panelists or attendees got any thoughts on the poll? What's your response? As perhaps you can, you can type them in. You might be a, a consultant or a trainer involved in, in some of these fields. Um, so we'd love to hear your, your viewpoint. Um, can I can I ask if uh, the two Davids have you picked up anything from what you've seen so far on the uh, on the chat? Yeah, I, I, David Wilson here. I, I think yes. um, um, the, first, the one question was an interesting one. Do you need talent at any level? 
um, you know, or is there a level at which you just not bother with talent? And the answer is, good Lord, no. Uh, I mean, some of the most talented people in organizations are those who would be in the lowest hierarchical positions, with apologies to any chairman listening or, or to CEOs. Um, they know about the business, and um, they, they meet the people in the organization, and they know how the organization ticks. Um, and the one question was about the Kaizen approach, um, you know, uh, making sure that knowledge and is instilled in everybody and that everybody knows uh, what's going on in the organization and their place in it. I think that's very important. And the second thing I would say, which is UK-specific, or at least it started UK-specific, but would, would involve those who are in the public sector and the non-profit sector who are listening, uh, and that is uh, Brian's distinction between non-discretionary and discretionary um, work. Non-discretionary being that that you have to do and can get measured. But actually where you get the, the real traction is from discretionary activities, which are going the extra mile, basically, uh, which is part of instilling that commitment. And I know a lot of recipes for change that were developed within for-profit organizations were immediately translated uh, into public sector and, and third sector organizations actually without a great deal of translation. Um, and of course, these organizations are not for profit. They have a completely different set of values and people are committed to them in different ways. So as soon as you start closing down somebody's role into non-discretionary activity in a voluntary organization, for example, you're going to expect trouble. So I think that end of the spectrum, decisiveness, commitment, leadership, and changes of habit is equally important across all three sectors. Brilliant. Well, thanks, thanks very much for that. There's some very interesting comments coming through on the chat. If, if you can use the Q&A, that's great. I'm just, I'm, when I see something in the chat, I'm copying and pasting and putting it back so all participants can see it. So, uh, yeah, the connection between A and B. Right, we have to move on now to our, our third and final um, uh, video segment uh, in which we have a segment from Robin uh, Tucker and then from Dr. Ben Hardy. So let's roll to video three, and I'll pass the control to my colleague, Janet. The important of, in any business situation, there's a lot of temptation, particularly in a big and well-resourced industry, that when, when you're starting with the objectives, you want to get to the essence of solution, the, the two or three things that really, really matter. To you, but as you dive into the ocean of um, the kind of details and that you need to cover to get to the answer, you can see more details beyond them that you need. You just feel, oh yeah, well, I know what the sales force, how we're going to deploy them, but exactly what the, ter the territory is going to be and what kind of are they going to have their own cars or are they going to have company cars or whatever. And there's another detail beyond there, another detail, and I've seen time after time companies get lost, big and well-managed ones in particular, in those micro details and end up what we call managing down with the crabs at the bottom. A smaller type of company has a, sometimes has a different behaviour. It might be led by uh, the person who's founded the firm. There, you might skim across the surface, actually not grab any of the important detail and just manage on a hunch. And that has its own different kinds of dangers. And the real trick here is knowing how much of that detail to dip into, uh, and then when to pull up, to helicopter up, as we uh, sometimes call it, um, to come back to the essence. I talked about that as uh, not a sequence, but as a chain. Just like a chain, of course, it's as strong as its weakest link. And like a chain, you really need to forge the whole thing at once, rather than um, building it up one link in, at a time. Uh, and so we've called that the value creation chain consistent things that run across the whole thing. There are always people issues. And of course, leadership is a, is a big driver. And I know those are in t topics being covered um, earlier and uh, later today. We find as we look at this then, there are basically five ways that major strategic change that can go wrong in our parlance. The first is that it's a badly conceived direction. Um, the second, that that direction is well sorted, but it actually hasn't been well translated into the detail that's necessary, the important things that the business needs to do to deliver it properly. It's underdeveloped. The third is a lacking in management along the way. Um, so that's where the program management falls apart or the project management, something critical isn't ready at the right time or, or the effort just kind of diffuses. Uh, and the fourth and final one is the, the bad operational landing. When you've got all of those things in place, 
but somehow when you start working it, it doesn't, um, just doesn't work for some reason. Finally, underlying that, uh, and often a cause of the one, some of the ones above, is where it's been poorly led and communicated. So let, let's, uh, I'm going to pick on a few specific areas of, of little things we found useful to focus on the essence. So this one we, we call crossing the river, or, or getting on the left bank. And um, uh, this, is the, this is the one important thing you need to know about marketing. As the, a business which is a, a, a supplier of some product or service, you, are, you have a lot of things to worry about. You have your own R&D, you have your manufacturing or your delivery service, you have logistics, you have sales, you have your image to think about. Your customer has a completely different set of those. So it really helps to think of them as a long way distant from you. Uh, and we, we use a simple device of imagine a big river, River Thames, River Seine, whatever, in the middle of you. And you're kind of peering across at your customers, trying to understand what they're worried about, what they're thinking, what they're doing that, that relates to you. What you really need to do is get over on their side of the river, learn their world, and then bring that knowledge back to your side of the river so that you can recast your offer in their context, in their language. So the philosopher Paul Grice thought a bit about this and thought about the types of, um, about how people communicate. And he had these four maxims, but there's one about quantity, so you can make your contribution as informative as required. Maximum of quality, um, don't lie. The maximum of relation, say things that are relevant and pertinent to the discussion. And then the maximum of manner. Um, and the idea is that these four maxims uh, we all tacitly use to, uh, to make sure that we communicate effectively. But what this does is it frees us up from this idea that we are reading a kind of logical string of code. So when we put a sentence together, we need not to think about what the sentence says, but what we need to do is move to thinking about how it's received. So instead of thinking us as the transmitter, we have to refocus completely on the recipient of the message. And that is the key point that I'm making in communicating strategic change. Because you can imagine, you're sat in a room, you've got your press officer there, and you're saying, right, we're going to do this. And they go, oh, it's brilliant. Yeah, we're going to do that. Great, yeah. Now, can you do that? Yeah, no, I'll make it sound brilliant. It'll be really compelling. Everyone will love it. No. Because you're thinking about what you're saying. You're not thinking about what's going to be heard. In communications, there is this gap, and I've talked about it a bit, and we, we've done the exercise in it, between thus, us and them. And so we start off by seeing things slightly differently. We then apply our assumptions about the world. Oh, so-and-so does that because, you know, you'll find that people in the marketing department always think that. We then apply confirmation bias. Oh, so they've gone and done that. Well, mm. I can think of 15 reasons why they do that. You know, and we, we find, funnily enough, we agree with ourselves. At the same time, of course, they've seen something slightly different. They've applied a different set of assumptions. They, too, have found a load of information that agrees with them and disagrees with us. So now we've got two positions. And then we get to this great bit of fundamental attribution error where I'm right and you're a pillock and vice versa, and we can't talk to each other. And so at the heart of communicating change is this problem of this gap that opens up. And the question is, how do you narrow it? And there is no substitution for reconnaissance. You've got to go out and talk to people. It's painful because they will shout at you and they will disagree with you, but you will find out. And then this last slide, and you may have seen this before, is um, O Sensei was the founder of Aikido, the martial art. And he was fighting one day, and one of his students said to him, he said, it's remarkable, you never lose your balance. And O Sensei said back to him, he said, no, 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 you're quite wrong. He said, I'm constantly losing my balance, but my skill lies in regaining it. And it's the same thing with communication. It is going to go wrong. Don't start from a point of perfection, but start from an understanding it's not going to work perfectly, and then draw it back and recover gracefully. And that's, in communicating change, that's the key thing. You can do all these things, you can think about it from the other person's point of view, you can think about the factors that will inter affect interpretation, you can think about their perceptions, you can think about their context, 
Even doing all that, you're going to get it wrong. Don't sweat it. Go out into the field, get shouted at a bit, but try and recover gracefully. And then do it better next time. Okay, well, that was a really interesting uh, set of two video clips here about something I think all of us feel is, is deeply personal because it's our individual responsibility, irrespective of the, of the structures, the culture, the leadership, to really try and improve our, our communications. Um, we have two very excellent speakers, so if you get a chance to see them again, indeed all, all the speakers, um, I'm sure you know, Google them. Uh, search for them. They are around, uh, definitely not to be missed, including uh, David Wilson, who's with us today. Uh, we've got a poll here. Now, this is really for something to you. Hold up a mirror to yourself. Uh, which of these do you really need to work on the most, particularly when we have you know, communication difficulties? And we're looking at the model that uh, Dr. Ben Hardy just showed us. Um, is it about finding out about more how others perceive the situation, i.e. the bottom of that sort of gap opening up? Is it B, actually actively checking my assumptions against other people's? Because I bet we often don't do that. We don't do enough of it. Is it, is it C, about uh, the confirmation bias? Am I, should I actively look at information that actually challenges my own beliefs or those of my team? Am I too wedded to simply looking at the stuff that, that reinforces what I already believe? Or is it a D, that, uh, looking at this idea of the fundamental attribution error? Is it about breaking down the whole us and them attitude, that, that uh, I'm right and you're wrong? Um, uh, uh, so what, what do we think? What's your personal experience in terms of what do you personally need to work on the most in your particular context? So let's just uh, see what's happening on the poll there. Uh, meanwhile, I'll, I'll come to David uh, Montgomery before the, the poll closes. Uh, David, this, this idea of that, that first model that was talked about looking at the, um, uh, the, 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 the change model, going to the essence and not getting bogged down in, in the crabs, uh, in the detail of the seabed, how, how do we actually keep our heads up and really focus on the really important stuff that we need to communicate? What's your, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I think the starting point is it's, it's like if you're going on a journey and you want to know where you are, you need a map if, uh, to check where you are. So if you set out on a journey and say, well, we're going to abandon the map and we'll just go uh, generally in this direction because that looks interesting, you're going to get yourself in trouble. So I think you, it's, it's important to regularly check with the people that you're dealing with who are going to be implementing the change uh, that the message is getting through, and also checking where you are, is that the message you're trying to get through? And go back, check what you originally set out to do. It was said at the, at the, the, in the first uh, video clip that uh, change often uh, do doesn't succeed. Um, why is that? Is it because we've lost sight of the direction we're going in? It's important to know where you're trying to get to and keep measuring whether, keep checking, are you, get, are you getting there? Because it's easy as I said, if you set out without and abandon the map you spend ages developing and then just uh, set off into the desert, you're, li you're likely to get lost. Uh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. D um, David, this um, Dave, David Wilson, when you, when we, in that last segment there from Ben, he had the picture of uh, the martial arts person and this idea of balance, and this links in with this idea that things aren't always going to go right the first time. But, but how do organizations actually reward people taking that kind of risk because change isn't always going to work we're not always going to be perfectly balanced and then we need to recover so from from, you, from your studies i mean how, how do organizations actually allow those kind of mistakes or errors to be made well this this goes back to culture um and and the first thing i would stress is is not to induce or create or promote a, a punishment culture um uh, uh, things are bound to go wrong and um and along the way and there are always unforeseen things um it's not even as uh, David Montgomery talked about a map. Well, well that, that's pretty certain. As long as you can read a map and get it the right way around, you're okay. Right. But the thing about the thing about change is, it, it's not a linear process. It's not a long period of thinking followed by a long period of acting. It's a lot messier than that. It, it's a it's a, a circle. And I, I noticed one of the participants talked about Mike Peddler's um, 
processual bottle of change. Now, I, I would adhere to that too. And I think the way to reward people and, and, and is, is, is not to not to beat them about the head when when it doesn't fit some linear plan that's uh, often laid out. But actually, change isn't like that. It doesn't fit the plan, and things do go wrong. Uh, and often, you know, thing, out of things going wrong, uh, good things can emerge. Um, you see that in the pharmaceutical industry all the time. You see that in pure science all the time, which is a science of experimentation. No scientist really knows what's going to happen. Um, so it's this fallacy that, you know, that things are certain. Um, but we do have a tendency, I have to say, and my studies would show this, to to blame those who get it wrong. And, and it's partly wrapped up with, doc, with what Dr. Hardy was saying, that we have these built-in assumptions about um, functions, people, types, stereotypes. And when something does happen, we just say, oh, well, they would do that, wouldn't they? I mean, that, that, that's the tendency. Yeah. Okay, now, well, we've now got the, uh, the poll results that have come through. So um, I'm going to ask uh, David Montgomery to, to, to make a comment. Um, what, do, what do you think of what, what we've seen? A's got the most. It seems to kind of uh, mirror that, um, that diagram we saw of the gulf opening out. So um, A at the bottom. And, and, and D perhaps having having C and D having least. Uh, well, I think it polls. comes. I, what, I, what, what do you think of this? I, I think it's it's fair to say that that all all four have merit. But in relation to the, the first one, um, it's really about. It's not just a, a case of you know. As I said, you're not sending a parcel. You're trying to send a message. You're trying to convey a message. And what, as Ben explained, and in, you know, is it what your communications expert has put together. Is that what's actually been heard? Or it's important to find out because if you're sending one thing, it's, it's not straight talking over a, a walkie-talkie message gone, click, uh, they've got it, now something will happen. It's have they understood? Do they agree? It's about getting out there and, and finding out what do people actually think. It's not just about perceptions. What do they actually think? And uh, I think he, he went on to say that, you know, sometimes they, you, you might find yourself getting some pretty fiery receptions, but at least you'll find out, is the message getting through? Is that the message you wanted to get through? And if it isn't, how do you change that? It's about yes. uh, reflecting on where you are and, and where you're trying to get to. I, I'll, I'll come to, uh, to, 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 to David Wilson again. If we look at the, uh, if, if we look at that poll and look at the context of the, of the questions about this sort of iterative, iterative nature, um, how, how, how do we? I mean, how, how should organisations actually, for example, uh, see, you know, challenge the information they're getting? I mean, you know, especially in the email age and when we're doing searching, how, how much time should we actually spend walking to the other department or customers or others and saying, are you, are you sure you're right about that, and having a dialogue? A difficult, um, di difficult it seems to increase the communication burden. Absolutely, uh, difficult to put a figure on it, but. Um um, I once did an experiment in an organization where they turned the email off for the whole day. Nobody right. got any an email or was able to receive or send. Work to treat. People actually had to get off their bottoms and go and speak to each other. Um, and, it, it, and, and that kind of communication, which is known in, the, in, in America as the water cooler effect, which is where people gather around the water cooler, has been proven in many studies uh, to be far more effective than intranets, uh, email systems, uh, and, and, and all the te technologically enhanced uh, ways of communicating that we've now developed. It, it's amazing how people perceive not only the situation differently, but also perceive you as a manager differently from the way you perceive yourself as well. And, it, you know, it, it's very useful to get, the fe get feedback on how people perceive you as a manager, how they see you, what they think of you, what your style is, and so on. And it can be quite, as Ben said, it can be quite confrontational sometimes, or confronting, I should say. Uh, but nevertheless, that's important information, because it means the message is or is not getting through, depending on the answer. Yes, yes. There's a, uh, uh, absolutely. Um, I, I remember an occasion once where somebody said to me, do you know what people think when you actually walk in the room? And it kind of stopped me in my tracks, and I had to think and reflect. So maybe, maybe that's a good, a, good, uh, a good question that managers can use to help uh, develop awareness in others. It's um, a very, there, it's there's a, a point here I want us to, uh, uh, David Montgomery, to respond to. Somebody was saying, uh, Alan Watson was saying that point A there seems to be fundamental to B, C, and D. So uh, the question is, uh, is there a kind of an order in which we do these things, or, or actually uh, should, should we go straight, straight for D right from the start and, and really try and... Um, create a greater sense of togetherness. What, what, what's your um, advice on that? I think 
the whole um, one of the fundamental messages about change is, is it's not strictly speaking fund, uh, formulaic, um, and I, I think you have to find what is your situation. I, I can see there is a, a, a logic to that, uh, um, but it's. What works in your organization? There have been some posts up already about the NHS, 1.3 million people. Your organization might only have 30. What, the channels that you use in um, the, the NHS are likely to be ra rather different to what you'd use in 30. Um, but in, in the end, getting to, you know, breaking down any of us and their mat attitudes will only happen if you are communicating. And when we, the word communication is, is used, I, I often think of what George Bernard Shaw said, is the problem with communication is the illusion that it has been achieved. And all of these steps is about dispelling the illusion that it has been achieved. It's about getting out and making sure that the message is getting through. And maybe what you're hearing back from the people is not what you expected in the first place. And that might then in turn add to the mix, if that answers your question. Uh, uh, lo lovely, thanks. Yeah, and, and it's incredibly difficult in this webinar context because you have a mixture of, of somebody hearing and somebody uh, speaking and, and, and the chat. So it's a very uh, interesting challenge. Well, we're, we're coming to the end, really, uh, and I'm going to be asking our, um, our panelists to really get, give a final sort of um, uh, wrap-up and any final questions that, that are coming through on, on our chat we can respond to. So um, I'll ask David Montgomery first. If, if, could you summarize from what you've seen on, 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 the, on the videos and the sort of nature of the chat that's coming through uh, about implementing change? What, what, any, any final reflections uh, looking across the, uh, the webinar? Well, I, I saw a, an interesting point that was made, I think it was by Paul Williams, who said that if you're in an organization that has gone through a lot of change, you do actually become more adept at learning how to overcome the fear. And I think there's a lot of fear involved. If you think of change as a a surrogate for, for learning. Change in learning, to me, are inextricably linked. If you ask a child to draw something, they, they don't hesitate to get up and draw. If you ask an adult or a class full of adults to draw something, there's a great deal of hesitation. There's always this fear of doing something and doing it wrong. And, and, and I think Dave Wilson also mentioned that. It's, it's not about, it's about, you have to experiment. You have to learn by trial and error. You're not going to get it yeah. right necessarily the first time. And I think... Okay. Uh, I think in, in a nutshell, we have to learn to dispel the, the L plate, the red L plate, and not feel a fear of learning. We have to engage and embrace and learn from what, what happens, learn from our successes and our failures. And thank you very much. And, and, and David, what's your uh, perception? Because you, 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 um, you kind of uh, coordinated the, the uh, or opened up the, the day on the 11th, um, and you, you seem to reflect on your, on your clip and others. So, uh, and you've final thoughts from you? Yeah, I think, I think three or four things. Uh, one is the theme that goes through the, the whole day w w was this word talent that got picked up that Phil Smith used, and I used knowledge base and so on, but it was used quite a lot. And smart, smart organizations do things a lot better than those which are less smart. Um, and smart people, by the way, can get around all sorts of structures. Um, you know, e even, even huge companies like the NHS, which is what, the, the, the fourth or fifth largest company in the world, um, then um, they, they can get around structures um, and work around them. The second point is this uh, learning doesn't just come by success, learning also comes by failure. Uh, and all change is uncertain and it happens over long periods of time. So actually learning and, uh, and, and reflecting on that uncertainty and learning by when things go slightly wrong and being able to reverse is another very important thing. Somebody else whose name I've forgotten, with apologies, um, mentioned some time ago, uh, how do you sort the wheat from the chaff? And the answer is you have to. You have to decide what's important. Um, you know, we live in an era where change comes at us or, or is part of us on a daily, if not a you know, half daily, hourly basis. You have to decide what's important and you have to stick with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think those are really the key lessons that came through uh, the day, topped by Ben Hardy basically saying, Always remember the message you give out is not necessarily the message that's being received. Brilliant. A absolutely. Well, look, um, this is that. thank you very much uh, to, to our two Davids and the team. Um, just a couple of slides to sort of wrap up about uh, what's happening next. Um, next business perspectives is going to be in October, date to be announced on strategic marketing. More information from the, the website. Um, you'll get an email soon about when this web webinar recording is available, 
Uh, meanwhile, blog away on our uh, website. Um, if you've got any ideas, there's the uh, email. And a final um, thank you. So again, uh, you can see what the Alumni Careers Network can do for you. And, and you're all part of uh, a massive, huge network, so let's help work with each other. And I look forward to seeing your comments and seeing you at the next um, webinar. So thank you to all involved and, and the technical team uh, and the alumni office behind it. Um, and that's a good night from me. Thank you all. Bye-bye.